¿Qué tal, juego amigos? Bienvenidos a un programa nuevo de Juegos, Juguetes y Coleccionables. Yo soy Ricardo Méndez y me encuentro en la Unboxing Toy Convention, eh, la primera convención en su estilo, en su género aquí en la Ciudad de México. Y es para mí un honor, un gran privilegio estar entrevistando ni más ni menos que una de las leyendas de nuestra eh, profesión, de lo que nos dedicamos, a lo que es el coleccionismo y tenemos en estos momentos a el creador de una de las figuras, entre muchas otras cosas, pero una de las figuras más importantes de la serie de Star Wars que es Buffett, tenemos ni más ni menos que a Jim uh, Stranger. Hi, Hi, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, I know you were in, in Kenner since the early 70s, so The first thing I, sh I think I, I'm going to ask you is, how was making toys then and how, how it is making toys now? Oh dear, I haven't made toys in a long time. But uh, back in the old days, people have to remember we didn't have computers or cell phones. So it was all done pretty much by hand. So uh, the drawings that I've, I did way back now are all on paper. Uh, the models were all sculpted in wax. Uh, so now, the things I see now are done, a lot of work's done on computer, the sculptors are doing 3D, you know, they never really, many of them don't ever touch wax, so it's, it's come a long way. I've worked on a lot of different things at Kenner. I started in 1972, so I worked on Spirograph and Play-Doh, some preschool toys, uh, so we were working on a lot of stuff. I worked on uh, the very first Mix Six Million Dollar Man, which was one of the first really important licenses for Kenner. So I, I've worked on a variety of projects. So it's, it's and it's real different now because I think people are uh, expecting a lot more licensing. So you see a lot of that here. Licensing at the time, Six Million Dollar Man was one of the first really successful licenses. So the toy business used to be more about fun than licensing. Now it's kind of turned around. You know, almost everything has a license of some sort, either a TV show or a movie. So it's, uh, don't know, somehow I think it's a little less creative. You know, there are fewer things like, I worked uh, with people that invented uh, Stretch Armstrong, which is a really kind of radical toy for, and uh, Easy Bake Oven. All those things were invented by people that just had a passion for play. In some ways it was more fun, because we it really stretched your brain to come up with things like the Six Million Dollar Man or Baby Alive, a doll that eats and poops. You know, that was really radical. At the time, Kenner was owned by a cereal company, by General Mills. And that selling that into General Mills, which was a very conservative cereal company, was a job for a good marketing person. So. You know, it, so it's changed a lot, and I've enjoyed seeing it. Uh, the Six Million Dollar Man, which, uh, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but the, we knew the show here as the Bionic Man. That was his name here in Mexico. But I mean, the, the figure was pretty much a, GI, a standard GI Joe. But you had this amazing feature, which is, was the eye. Now, that concept, um, I mean, that I think that was the, the, the truly success of, 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 of the toy, uh, exactly. Now, how do you approach this? How do you approach a uh, $6 million dollar man uh, toy figure? At the time, we were, we'd looked at the TV show, uh, and we were looking for ways of describing the features in, in the toy. So the, the, peep, the, the bionic eye was one thing that I came up with And I actually, the first model was, uh, if you go to a, in most hotels, there's a peephole in the door. So you can look through it to see if there's, well, I basically took that, drilled a hole in the back of his head and put a, a peephole through his, and we, that's the very, the, the very beginning of that concept. And then that once we decided that that was one of the features we'd put into it, The engineers took it and tried to then had to shrink it down because at the time having a six million dollar man with a peephole sticking out of his the back of his head wasn't going to work very well. And there were other designers coming up with the skin that rolled back and the mechanism for raising his arm. All that stuff was done by different designers that lent their talents to it. Star Wars. I mean, nobody, nobody expect that it would become such a success. 
Um, how did you uh, approach the idea? Of, well, I mean, uh, how did it became Star Wars in, in Kenner? In, in, in all, how, how was the beginning of it? Okay. The way it worked at Kenner, I worked in preliminary design, which was our concept area where we we looked at TV and movie scripts and looked for you know basic concepts like uh, like we would be looking for the next Easy Bake Oven. So we were in an area where we were looking for new ideas. And I was in college. I had seen THX 1138, which was George Lucas's thesis film. And so I was a fan, kind of. You know, I knew him and liked the film. And then uh, in 76, there was a little article in Starlog magazine that mentioned that he was following up American Graffiti with a new science fiction movie called Star Wars. So those two things were kind of in the back of my brain. And my my boss, Dave Okada, brought a script and black and white photographs from the live action for the movie and came into this, our studio and said, Does somebody want to take a look at this? He said, it's a movie by this George Lucas. And I was like, that's that. I'll take it. I'll take it. So that literally is what happened. I took it home, the script home, read the script, went through the black and white photographs that they'd sent, and went back, gave it to Dave Okada to read, and said, lock your door, go in your office, read this, we've got to do it. This is, you know, this is a toy property. So that's where it started. But at the time, it went against conventional wisdom because Toys run from September to December. That's the major market. So we're looking at, we'd seen a little blurb, got the script very early in 77, but by the time we would produce product, it would be 78. And the marketing department was a little leery of doing a movie that opened in May, that we wouldn't get product out until the next year, thinking that the movie would never make it that far. Because nobody, nobody knew. I mean. George is a great director, but it really wasn't, they really didn't know how long it would last. So the l good part of it is that Bernie Loomis, who ran the company at the time, said, now we, we're not sure, we're, we're a little leery of this, but uh, if you're that passionate, go ahead and work on it and we'll see how, you know, see how it goes. So for, for a couple months, we worked on it with no, no one saying, yeah, we got to write a check. So Dave Okad and I put together what we had done, and in March we showed it to 20th Century Fox, partially to say, yes, Kenner could do this, because we were kind of middle-range toy company. Mattel and Coleco had already turned the property down, and they were the big guns because of Cabbage Patch and Barbie and Hot Wheels. So we got the opportunity to look at it, and we were developing product. We went on March and showed it, they were convinced that we, and the negotiations were really starting to go back and forth. And then in May, they had assigned a marketing person to it, but they still were kind of like, I'm not sure. So May 2nd, I got to be the Kenner representative at a market research screening on the 2nd of May, and went out and saw the movie for the first time. And that, nailed it for me. I mean, I was already convinced, but at this screening, they uh, they had gotten the theater perfect for all these, they recruited a, an audience, you know, men and women, all different age groups, and showed the film, and that when the that first destroyer comes over, they had the base turned up so that everybody's seat was shaking, and you could just, you could hear the gas of people going, <gasps> You just hear the air being sucked out of the theater. And then at the end, when people stood up and cheered, it was like, I was just, I was, I, that was, I was amazed. And I'm the only person from Kenner. So I had to go out and find a pay phone because you couldn't, no, <laughs> there weren't any cell phones. So I found a pay phone and called back to Cincinnati and said, you cannot believe this. So I got, and I got to do all kinds of stuff from then on. I was. I got to look at every product that it came out for Star Wars for a couple of years, and then uh, it just went on from there. Now you have the chance to 
create one of the most beloved uh, figures. Just, I mean, the character itself, it is quite uh, uh, cherished by the by the audience, Boba Fett. But you got actually to, to the, the one who designed the, yeah. the the doll. And how's that been for you? Well, it was fun uh, because it was a secret. They were going to let us do Boba Fett as the uh, uh, premium for you know. I don't know how many. You, somebody here knows for sure, but you you had to buy so many figures, and then we would send you a free Boba Fett. So George was going to let us do that, and invited my boss and I out to L.A. to see the the costume for the first time. So I took pictures of the costume, and then brought him back, and I did the original. You know, I carved up the the first figure. And it's made out of multiple parts from different characters in the line, but that was my my contribution to him. The model maker built a backpack for him that had the rocket that fired and all. So, and then that all was turned over to production design, and eventually the the rocket firing had to be taken out for safety reasons. But but I got I was out there for the you know, and it was it was a kind of top secret project. Is they didn't want it. I mean, George was very jealous of all that, that uh, his baby. So he was uh, trusting enough to let us come out and photograph it. It was very risky doing this uh, line of figures, especially by the size. I mean, uh, downsize uh, model to three three quarters, which was already um, a standard having the 12 inches, like the million dollar man. I mean, everything was risky over here. But I don't know how many. Um, thought you, you you gave on that? I mean, all the department to, to decide this. Well, the, the whole decision was when you read the script, the de the descriptions of the TIE fighters and the X-Wings fighting, blowing up the Death Star, it was just obvious that for uh, for me, that boys were going to want to play with those, those parts of it. They weren't so much at that point. Yeah, you had a G.I. Joe or a $6 million dollar man, but that was kind of a singer, single figure. You weren't buying multiples, you could buy outfits and stuff, but we wanted, I, I just knew that if I were a kid, I wanted to play with the spaceships, not so much, you know, playing figures. So it seemed obvious to me, and I looked, went out and found some figures I could start with. And then they grew because there's a story about Bernie Loomis in some big meeting that he said, yeah, I think this the figures are too small. Why don't we make them this big? And somebody took a ruler and said, oh, three and three quarters. And that's how they grew to three and three quarters. So I did, wasn't in the meeting. That's the legend. Could have happened that way. But that's as good an explanation. So that's really changed how boys played with, with figures. Instead of having a big 12-inch character, They suddenly were, you know, they wanted to have all the figures, have all the play sets, have all the spaceships. Really changed the whole toy industry. And as a kid who grows up in the 80s with these toys, I'm really grateful for it <laughs> because we couldn't relieve the stars, the Star Wars series, every way we wanted. So thank you very much. Well, it wasn't just me, but it, I had a great time. It was a really fun time to be a toy designer and really have a, you know, put an imprint on the toy business. Now I look at these, the shows like this one, and it, I'm just astounded. I, I was at the last celebration coming here. It's just the, the, the passion that people have is just amazing. Strawberry had this uh, special feature, I, I guess, of the, uh, which was the smell. I mean, I, I, that's pretty much the first uh, doll uh, that I remember that had that particular smell and I'm gonna tell you I have an original strawberry shortcake and it still smells yeah. it, where, where did it came that idea I mean that, 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 that ultimately became part of the, of the character that, that was really developed with uh, an exterior group of, of uh, Kenner and uh, General Mills along with American Greetings and the, they always wanted the smell part of it to happen the, the actual chemistry of it was developed at Kenner Because we had to work, they had to work on the chemistry of mixing the vinyl with the scents, and not have them destroy one or the other. Because you're using a heat process with vinyl to rotocast, 
So you're, you're heating things up and scents generally don't like to be heated up because that's how they evaporate and lose their smell. At the time, and I still now, the, the toy companies have chemists that they had to develop special vinyl uh, formulations that would work with the scents. So I, you know, the scents were developed by a, a couple of companies that specialize in, and they worked with, in concert with the uh, Kenner designers and uh, engineers. So. What you have here, uh, what, what we can see um, uh, some of the sketches and prototypes. This one drawing is the first sketches I did of the figures, and then the the models of the figures that I did. These are based on some old uh, Fisher Price characters. These are the very first prototypes before we really had much uh, scrap from the from Lucasfilm. So th we had some photographs, but not much dimensional work. So we were a little bit guessing, but they had the first features, the sound and the lights that we were putting in. With these concepts, the first lightsaber was inflatable. We looked at the remote control. We eventually made an RC, radio control. And then, so this was early stuff. I mean, you're designing this and, and then went to another yeah. lines, uh, like Strawberry Shortcake. Yeah. Now it's a new version of it. So, I mean, how's for you now seeing back and now? Well, I, I, gave, I gave up Star Wars. I, uh, I got it. I got an invitation by the marketing department to change to the dark side, as we put it, as designers put it. So I went to the dark side of marketing, and uh, I became the product manager for Strawberry Shortcake, and uh, developed that line with the designers into a 350 million dollar franchise for Kenner by 1985. So I, I completely switched from science fiction to girls' fantasies. So. It was a real. It was a transition, but it's all creative. That's the part that I like. You know, I was. I started out as a kid, you know, drawing pictures, and I, you know, kept that in my my life all the time. And I moved into marketing, and product was the most important part of it for me. The numbers game wasn't my strong suit, but there are plenty of those people around. So, but I, I, I enjoyed them all. Strawberry is fun. I probably comb more doll hair than any little girl in America over those five years going to commercial shoots. And well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure and an honor speaking with you about toys, toys, toys. <laughs> pues bueno, esto ha sido un placer para mí. Yo soy Ricardo Méndez. Gracias por acompañarnos aquí en Juegos, Juguetes y Coleccionables. Bernie estuvo en la cámara y nos vemos en la próxima.